Let's review what we know about cyclic groups. So first we have the definition of a cyclic group. A group G is cyclic if there exists an element A in G such that G equals all the powers of A. And the generator of the group is that A that generates the group. And that means that it's just a bunch of powers of A that make up the entire group. And we also know that every cyclic group is abelian. And we know that cyclic groups can be infinite, and that would be like uh, z, the set of integers under addition, or finite, and that would be like z sub n, that would be the set of integers under addition mod n. And in fact, these are great examples to think of when you want to think of an infinite cyclic group or a finite cyclic group. And we'll see later that in a certain sense, these are the only cyclic groups you need to worry about. But let's look at these cases individually. So first we'll look at infinite cyclic groups. So z is a good example, the set of integers under addition, and z is generated by the element 1. And let's look at some orders of elements, and if you forget what it means to talk about the order of an element, here's the definition. If g is a group and a is an element of g, then the order of a denoted with absolute values around the a, um, but remember that's not absolute value, we're just talking about the order. That's the least positive integer n such that a to the n equals the identity. And if there is no such n, then the order of a is infinite. So the order of 1 is infinite. Why is that? Well, think about powers of 1. But remember, we're not actually talking about powers here. We're talking about uh, additive notation. So that'd be like n to the a, or I'm sorry, n times a equaling the identity here. And so we're going to look at multiples of a. And so uh, 1 plus 1 is 2, plus 1 is 3, plus 1 is 4, plus 1 is 5, plus 1 is 6, plus 1 is 7. If we keep adding uh, 1 here, looking at multiples of 1, it keeps going and going and going. It never gets to the identity, so the order of 1 is infinite. Same thing with 2. 2 plus 2 is 4, plus 2 is 6, plus 2 is 8, plus 2 is 10, plus 2 is 12, and so on. You can see why 2, the order of 2, would be infinite. And how about 10? I don't know. 10 plus 10 is 20, plus 10 is 30, plus 10 is 40. So you see that the order of 10 is infinite. And I think you get the idea here that the order of any of, the, any of these elements here is going to be infinite. Let's look at a negative 1. How about negative 1? The order of negative 1. Negative 1 plus negative 1 is negative 2. Plus negative 1 is negative 3. Plus negative 1 is negative 4, and so on. So the order is infinite, and you never get to the identity. And the same thing with the order of negative 2, or the order of negative 10, or the order of any of the elements, really, except for the identity. So let's make that a theorem. If G is an infinite cyclic group generated by A, then every element of G, aside from the identity, has infinite order. So we saw that it worked for the group of integers under addition, but we'll see that it works in general for any infinite cyclic group. So here's the theorem that we want to try and prove, and let's do the proof. Let G be an infinite cyclic group generated by A. This means that G is made up of powers of A. Suppose that little g is another element in the group and that little g is not the identity. Then little g must be a power of a because, well, all the elements in the group are powers of a. And note that g is not the identity, so m cannot be 0 here. For any integer k, then, g to the power k equals a to the m to the power k, which is just a to the mk power. But a to the mk power equals a to the 0 equals the identity if and only if k is 0. Why is that? Well, remember that m can't be 0, so k must be the thing that's 0 here. Thus, g to the k equals the identity if and only if k equals 0. And since no positive power of g is the identity, g has to have infinite order. Okay. Here's another theorem. Let G be a cyclic group of infinite order, and if A is an element of G and A is not the identity, then for any integers U and V, A to the U equals A to the V, if and only if U equals V. In other words, all the powers of A are distinct. We don't have any repeats here in the powers. Here's an outline of the proof. So for this thing, we need to prove both directions, a forward direction and a backwards direction. And I think one of them is super easy, the backwards direction here. That would be that uh, we assume here that u equals v, and we need to show that a to the u equals a to the v. And I think it's pretty clear that if u equals v, a to the u equals a to the v. There's not much to say about that. The forward direction is a little trickier. So we have a to the u equals a to the v. 
and we need to show that u equals v. So I'm going to rewrite this as a to the u times a to the negative v equals the identity, or a to the u minus v equals the identity. Okay, uh, so now what? Well, we know that the uh, order of A is infinite. We just showed that if we have a cyclic group of infinite order, that aside from the identity, all the elements have infinite order. And so if the order of A is infinite, that says that, I'll write that over here, that A to the N equals E, a power of A to the, equals the identity here, that is only true if N equals zero. So we have a very similar looking thing here. A to some power equals the identity. Well, that's only true if u minus v equals zero. And then that tells us that u equals v. Okay, let's do a formal proof. Okay, so here's the proof. Let g be a cyclic group of infinite order and let a be an element of g. If a is not the identity, then the order of a is infinite. We saw that before. So let's do the forward direction first. Suppose that a to the u equals a to the v, where u and v are integers. Then a to the u times a to the negative v equals the identity, or a to the u minus v power is the identity. Since a has infinite order, a to the n equals the identity if and only if n is zero. So this means that u minus v has to be zero, or that u equals v. And how about the backwards direction? This direction is super easy. Suppose that u equals v, where u and v are integers then it's clear that a to the u equals a to the v. Okay, let's look at finite cyclic groups. A good example would be z6, which consists of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And the binary operation here is addition mod 6. Let's look at some orders of elements. And again, if you forget what it means to talk about the order of an element, it's the least positive integer n such that a to the n is the identity. The order of 1 is 6. Why is that? Well, first off, remember that again we're talking about additive notation here. So instead of saying a to the n is the identity, I'm going to say n times a is the identity. And let's see how many times we have to add 1s together before we reach the identity. 1 plus 1 plus 1 is 3, plus 1 is 4, plus 1 is 5, plus 1 is 6, but 6 mod 6 is 0. Remember we're talking about addition mod 6. And you count up the 1s, there are 6 of them, so the order of 1 is 6. If we look at the order of 2, the order of 2 is 3. 2 plus 2 is 4, plus 2 is 6, but 6 mod 6 is 0. There are three 2s here, so the order of 2 is 3. Similarly, the order of 3 is 2, the order of 4 is 3, and the order of 5 is 6. Now, if you remember when we talked about infinite cyclic groups, we said that a to the u equaled a to the v only when u equaled v. In other words, we had all the powers being distinct. How about this case for finite cyclic groups? When does a to the u equal a to the v? Or in additive notation, when does u times a equal v times a? That's what we want to try and figure out. So let's look at an example. So we'll go back to the example that we had with the twos here, and we'll try and figure out when else do we get a zero here? Well, I could also do two plus two plus two plus 2 plus 2 plus 2, and that would also equal 0. That's uh, 6 plus 6 is 12, and 12 mod 6 is 0. And I can kind of rewrite this as multiples here. I can say that 3 times 2 is 0, and 6 times 2 is 0, using this uh, idea of a, a multiple here. And then I can look at the order of this and say the order of 2 is 3. So I can note that 3 divides 6 minus 3, where I'm taking the 6 from here and the 3 from here, and this 3 is this 3 right here. In other words, the order of the element divides the multiples, or in this case, uh, this thing out front here, the u and the v that we had last time. So this is kind of like saying n, the order of the element, is dividing the u minus v that we had before. So let me write it down as a theorem, and I think it'll become a little clearer here. The theorem is, let g be a cyclic group of finite order. If a is an element of g such that the order of a is n, then for all integers u and v, a to the u equals a to the v 
if and only if n divides u minus v. Okay, so let's try and prove this, and we'll start with an outline of a proof. So here's the theorem we're trying to prove, and we'll look at an outline of a proof here. And again, we have to look at both directions. So I'll start with the easier direction, the backwards direction. Let's suppose that n divides u minus v. Okay, and that means that uh, u minus v has to equal k times n for some integer k. That's just what it means to divide. That's the definition of saying that something divides something. And another way of saying this is that u equals v plus kn. Now I want to show that a to the u equals a to the v, so I should probably look at what a to the u is. And that would be a to the v plus kn. And that would be the same thing as a to the v times a to the kn. And that's the same thing as a to the v times a to the n to the k power. And the reason I'm doing that is because the order of a is n. That means that a to the n is the identity. n was the least positive integer such that a to the n was the identity. So a to the v, then I have in place of a to the n, the identity. And now I think you can see what happens here. This ends up just being a to the v times the identity, which is just a to the v. And so I have a to the u equals a to the v. The other direction is a little trickier. So we're going to start by saying a to the u equals a to the v. And I want to show that n divides u minus v. Well, I can rewrite this as a to the u minus v equals the identity. And now what? Well, I'm going to use something that we've used a couple times before, the division algorithm. And that says that u minus v equals, and then we have a quotient and a remainder here, q is a quotient, qn plus a remainder r, where q and r are integers. And we have another condition here, the remainder here is greater than or equal to zero, but less than n. Okay, so how does that help us? Well, if I look at a to the u minus v, which I should point out was the identity, then that's the same thing as a to the qn plus r. And now I'm going to do something very similar to what I did before. I'm going to rewrite this as a to the n to the q times a to the r. And now remember that a to the n is the least positive integer such that uh, we get the identity. So we have the identity here. And we know that the identity times a to the r is just a to the r. Great. So I have a to the r is the identity. A to the r is the identity, but here's a subtle point here. Remember that in the definition of the order of an element, n was the least positive integer, such that a to the n was the identity. That means if a to the r is also the identity, r is either greater than n or it's not positive. Well, r can't be greater than n. We have right here that r is less than n by the condition on the division algorithm. That means r can't be positive. Well, r has to be greater than or equal to zero, so the only option left, r has to be zero. And if r is zero, then u minus v is just q times n, and I have that n divides u minus v. Perfect. Okay, let's do a formal proof. Okay, so here's the proof. Let g be a cyclic group of finite order, and let a be an element of g such that the order of a is n. This means that n is the least positive integer such that a to the n equals the identity. So we'll start with the forward direction. Suppose that a to the u equals a to the v, where u and v are integers. Then a to the u times a to the negative v equals a to the u minus v, which is the identity. And by the division algorithm, we know that there exist integers q and r such that u minus v equals qn plus r, where r is greater than or equal to zero, but less than n. So then the identity E is equal to A to the U minus V power. And in place of U minus V, I'm going to put in QN plus R. And then we do some uh, algebra here. And we note that A to the N is the identity here. And we end up getting that A to the R is the identity. Now here's the subtle point of this argument here. R is greater than or equal to zero, but less than N. But N is the least positive integer such that A to the N equals the identity. Well, if r is less than n, and a to the r is the identity, r has to be 0. 
because remember that n is the least positive integer such that a to the n is the identity. So if a to the r is the identity, r is either greater than n or it's not positive and it can't be greater than n and it can't be negative, so it must be zero. Thus, u minus v is q times n and n divides u minus v. The other direction is a little bit easier. Suppose that n divides u minus v, where u and v are integers. Then u minus v has to uh, equal k times n for some integer k. That's just what it means for the, the definition of something to divide something else. So u equals v plus kn. a to the u equals a to the v plus kn. And then we do some algebra here. Again, we note that a to the n is the identity. And that gives us a to the u equals a to the v.